Hello, everyone. I'm John Coleman here with another conversation with Timothy Flanders. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me, John. So Tim and I are going to talk about American Catholic literature today. Uh, just one brief announcement regarding apocastastasis, and that is if you have any poetry, prose, fiction or nonfiction, even drawings and so forth that you would like to see published, please write us at apocastastasis institute at aol.com in order to be considered for inclusion in our autumn journal, Sense and Worth. The topic is love and hate. We keep it broad, but uh, defined nonetheless. So if you have pieces that regard that topic, please get in touch. Before we talk about our selections and get into the meat of our time. Tim, can you tell us a bit about your work and your apostolate, I suppose we could say? Sure, yeah, thanks, John. So I, uh, again, Timothy Flanders, and I run The Meaning of Catholic. It's uh, addresses meaningofcatholic.com, and that is a lay apostolate um, on the internet, which provides information about the Catholic Church, the teachings of the Catholic Church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in particular, the something that's missing i think online is is a place for catholics to really debate topics with each other where they are able to disagree so we attempt to make a distinction between what the church teaches objectively and what catholics can disagree on and to hash those things out and on the internet there's a severe lack of not only truth but charity and so we try to present and uh, provide truth and charity where it's lacking. So that's the goal of Meaning of Catholic. And again, the site is meaningofcatholic.com. Excellent. And, and Tim has a whole slew of presentations uh, talking about the, the um, Orthodox schisms in the past on, on American Black Catholic uh, history, on the fathers, and so forth. So there's a great amount to check out there over at his site. And I will link those in the description of this recording. So Putting ourselves in the right frame of mind, this 19th week per autumn, uh, we consider the saints of this time of the summer, and they form their own dramatic medley, starting with Sixtus and Companions, Saint Romanos, Saint uh, Hippolytus, who was a young man at the time. We're recording on the memorial of him and, and Pontian. Uh, Saint Lawrence, probably being the most famous. Saint Apulius, uh, also at the same time. And on this partial memorial of, of St. Hippolytus and Pontian, uh, they died together, uh, and Hippolytus being an author himself, one of the early church writers, even Tertullian mentions hearing him speak and hearing of his writings, at least. We have literature on the brain. And when we approach the background of any community that's existed over a lengthy period of time, that could be a family, a uh, religious group, a national group, and so forth, uh, the, the artifacts they leave behind, the architecture, and so forth, these are really like specimens. As historians, it's how we look at them, almost like a flora and fauna of a particular environment. And that's certainly the case with Catholic literature and American uh, Catholic literature at that. So, uh, Tim, what are our selections today? Yeah, we're going to start off with the, the great 19th century Catholic convert, Rastis Brownson, and he's going to provide a critique of the celebrity philosopher of his day, which is Ralph Waldo Emerson. And then we will go to Graham Greene's Power and the Glory. Um, Graham Greene is a 20th century Catholic novelist, also well respected by uh, secular uh, colleges. And then finally, Flannery O'Connor, and another famous Catholic novelist outside the Catholic world. She's received a, some some of the uh, controversy recently because someone was able to dig up some kind of private remark that she made in a letter somewhere where it seemed to suggest she was racist or something, but uh, it sounded pretty ridiculous to me. Um, judging from the standards that we speak today, judging a woman who's, who died in 1964 in the South, uh, I think is a little 
ridiculous. But even so, if, if Flannery O'Connor made some remark uh, that was even sinful, uh, that's not something that, that causes us to dismiss her great work. There are many, so many, I mean, all the figures in history, and besides the saints, have black, little black marks and even big black marks, which doesn't dismiss their great work. So um, leaving aside the, the Marxist fanaticism out there uh, <laughs> that's going on with Flannery O'Connor, even in the Catholic world, uh, we'll look at the, the texts as they appear and take a look at some of their historical implications. And uh, John will be the literary ex expert among us. <laughs> I'll do what I can. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, well, I suppose Flannery O'Connor's in, in good company. There's been all sorts of good skins that have uh, <laughs> taken the brunt of things the past couple of years in terms of statuary and, and uh, historical uh, revisionism. All right. So um, as we consider American literature and American Catholic literature in this recording, it's going to set the stage, um, bring us back to high school, college, shake off the, uh, the dust and so forth. We were all thinking of lunch back in those days. No one was paying attention. So here's your, here's your nutshell class of, of things, right? Um, you have a great deal of European uh, settlement in, in the 16th, 17th centuries that is inherently, like anyone who's moved in your life, that's inherently going to cut ties with your past. By the mid-19th century, what that means, a very literary, very, um, very, very self-conscious, it's a, it's a, you know, a journal writing time, it's highly literate for various reasons, um, not altogether removed from, from Protestantism, um, and that background from Northern Europe, and a lot of those settlers would, would go ultimately to influence what would become uh, America uh, in a big way in cultural habits and so forth. It was also because of industrialism and the shift of the, the clock and the way people spent their days, it also allowed for massive books to be written and read, and a lot of things came together. People really introspective, really literate, came to the conclusion um, not without basis, that America did not have its own national literature in the sense that we could speak of the Chinese or the Arabs or the French and so forth having theirs. Because those people, their history goes back, as we say, into the mists of time. You get back far enough into those communities, right? They have, um, it, it, it gets misty like a child's memory in our lives, like uh, mythology and things. You go way back with the Irish or the Scots and, and so forth. Americans don't have that. This is uh, something very unusual in American culture. We don't have that lengthy connection artistically and, and so forth. So people uh, in the mid-19th century, you still have the... the the, the, the gasoline maybe the, turning into the fumes of the revolution and that, that early Republican movement, do it yourself and so forth. And there was this real desire to create a national American literature. And actually, before we jump into our selections, uh, Tim, you had a quote um, with a guy a little bit before um, Brownson, um, Webster. No, Webster, that, yeah. Would that be appropriate now to bring that yeah, quote sure. up? Yeah, so the, I, mean, I think this is, this is very, and this will tie in when we talk about Graham Greene and the Marxist attack on the church in Mexico. Um, this is the, a conscious break with the past is really the, uh, the aim of the Republican revolutions, especially in America. And you, I, it makes me think of um, the, the Russian Soviet propaganda, Peter and the Wolf which is actually a, a supposed to be a Marxist propaganda of him breaking with his, the old past, which is his old father and taming the wolf himself basically. And that's, that's kind of the, the idea with, with these revolutionary movements, whether it's with liberal movements in America or France or with later Bolshevism and Marxism is an attempt to break with the past and create a culture ex nihilo out of nothing by breaking with your parents and what you're, I think what you're saying, what you're getting at here is, yes. is so powerful because literature is, is one of the most powerful pieces of art that gets passed down. And, and I think it's uh, remarkable, especially when, when Noah Webster gets into the language, he starts to change the, the and this is why American words are spelled differently than <laughs> uh, British English words, because Noah Webster 
as one of the, the founders of this, this republic, wanted to make a conscious shift. And the, you see this with the Marxists. Here's one of the original, excellent. Um, so one of the original um, efforts of Republicans or Marxists is to actually change the language and change the terminology. And so it's so fundamental is the language. And then in this quote, I'm going to be quoting from this essay in 1789. So this is the, this is the year um, the, I believe the constitution was ratified in 1789, but the French revolution actually came up, uh, started going at, at that year as well. So um, this is, I'm sorry, 1790. So French revolution is raging. And he says this quote, Another defect in our schools, says Wester, which since the revolution, American revolution, is become inexcusable is the want of proper books. The collections which are now used consist of essays that respect foreign and ancient nations. The minds of youth are perpetually led to the history of Greece and Rome or to Great Britain. Boys are constantly repeating the acclamations of Demosthenes and Cicero or debates about some political question in the British Parliament. But every child in America should be acquainted with his own country. As soon as he opens his lips, he should rehearse the history of his own country. He should lisp the praise of liberty and those illustrious heroes and statements who have wrought a revolution in her favor. He also denigrates Greek and Latin as dead languages in this essay. And, and Charles Kalum comments on this and he says, quote, in a word, education ought not to be the expansion of the mind so as to assist both in life and salvation, but at base, ideological indoctrination <laughs> so that's that's very fascinating i think in 1790 where there's a, a very conscious shift in public education in an attempt to create a literary form that creates a new culture out of nothing which breaks consciously with the past denigrates the past as dead and not really special and so it's sort of a revolutionary mindset uh, but the problem with that is it's hard to pass that down because you write something and then, like we just talked about, Flannery O'Connor is getting thrown out because the next revolution, the next generation is following the same principle as the original revolution. And then they want to throw out the art and throw out and change the literature. And so since the foundational principle is revolution against your parents, it's difficult to pass that down. And so this is what you're, you're talking about, trying to struggle to create a, an American literature tradition within this sort of revolutionary mindset. And it's said, uh, it tongue in cheek, that all American literature was made between about 1849 and 1853. And that's not to be taken literally. But as we turn our attention to Orestes Brownson, um, a figure from about this time period, and um, uh, one who, whose uh, selection that we chose is, is indeed from this as well. Um, we think of the books that come about at this, this time period, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Moby Dick, um, uh, Little Women, and so forth. And, and a lot of this stuff is produced uh, at this same time period. And a lot of it's actually produced in, in and around Boston and, and actually the city of the town of Concord. And you can go to the Concord Cemetery as I have a video on this um, Apocastastasis channel, the, the channel of the college where I went about four years ago. You can actually go to the Concord Cemetery and see Emerson buried and, and uh, Henry David Thoreau and his brother and, and Louisa Alcott. They're actually all buried on the same ridge. Uh, it's really quite something. I'll put, the I'll put that in the description of this recording. But there was this, this burst. Some people have used the expression a genius burst that happens uh, occasionally. And, and one happened around Concord in Boston. And at the same time, as we've, we're setting the stage for Brownson and his comments on philosophy and on Emerson, they, probably the most famous um, writer at that time being Ralph Waldo, Emerson. Uh, we also want to give just a quick nod to the religious uh, environment of the mid-19th century. And I will say, um, I think as a testimony to the American character, um, if not the American mind, um, the, the people in this country have taken the Reformation to its logical conclusion. And you would see that even by the mid-19th century, where you would get literally 
Bible only Christians. If you look at the initial Reformation of Calvin and Zwingli and, and Cramner and so forth, that was largely a talking point because they made a great deal of, of um, use of councils and, and church traditions. By the 19th century, however, um, you have groups uh, like the Millerites, which, from which would spur in the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, even, even groups farther afield like the Hebrew Israelites in the 20th century. You have groups like the Mormons in upstate New York um, uh, accruing different texts altogether from scripture. And then you also had around Boston uh, an actual reappraisal of, of uh, Revelation itself, largely coming from Germany. And these would initially be the, the Unitarians, um, which caused a, a massive controversy uh, throughout congregational New England in particular. And then also uh, coming out of the same intellectual pool, but different altogether than the Unitarians, were the Transcendentalists, of which those authors such as uh, Emerson and, for a hot second, um, Brownson and um, Alcott and so forth, um, dallied in Melville a little bit more at arm's length as he was in New York. But we do have this in mind when we talk about Brownson and his conversion and his, his, um, his position on things and on Emerson. We do want to keep the insane uh, religious atmosphere of the mid-19th century in mind, just the, the absolute chaos. And it was a chaos, and, and I'll throw it back to Tim after this, it was a chaos <clears throat> that um, I don't think we understand in American Protestantism in, in the 21st century, which has largely in the face of secularism, um, circled its wagons and tamped down on, on doctrinal issues of any sophistication and kind of agreed on a, a C.S. Lewis type of mere Christianity and kind of backroom discussions if you're going to bring this up. In the 19th century, in the mid-19th century, that was not the case. And every, every roadside um, sect and so forth, they, they knew their doctrines and they, they argued them. And this, this uh, helps explain why you would have ultimately non-Christian groups like the Transcendentalists just saying to hell with the whole thing. And with that, I throw back to Tim as we get into the essay. Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, summation. There, you have these different evangelical tent revival movements in the American history, they call them, the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, and then they're just, they sort of descend into chaos as they start to fight against each other. And then sort of, sort of r seemingly rising above that chaos are these transcendentalists. And, um, Orestes Brownson summarizes this thought in his essay. He says, quote, Mr. Emerson, we presume, struck with the narrowness and the inconsistencies of all the religions he had studied and finding that they are all, they are all variable and transitory in their forms, Yet though that he also discovered something in them, or underlying them all, which is universal, invariable, and permanent, and which they are all honest efforts of the great soul to realize, he therefore came to the conclusion that the sage can accept none of these narrow, variable, and transitory forms, and yet can reject none of them as to the great, invariable, and underlying principles, which in fact is all they have that is real or profitable, end quote. So he's kind of and he, and he then he adds that he was a part of this Boston transcendental movement from about 1830 to 1841, where he first began to turn towards Catholicism. But he's identifying and sort of sympathizing with Emerson as to this this religious chaos that's going on, and recognizing that the the one commonality in all the Protestant sects is their variable and transitory nature, that they are constantly changing, dividing against one another over all sorts of things and he he identifies the transcendental movement it's basically to transcend uh this uh it, he says to distinguish between the transient and the permanent in religion was the common aim of the boston movement and so that is sort of a, an honest effort that he sees in the transcendentals to try to overcome uh, a, a serious lack of uh, philosophical grounding within all these warring parties. Excellent. We won't get into the discussions of Plato and Aristotle and so forth, which Emerson gets into. That would be um, maybe a, a more of a, a seminar recording or at least a seminar length recording all to itself, but very insightful um, 
that Brownson does bring up the um, the affinity of Plato with heretical groups throughout history, whether it was in the early church, um, or it could tend towards that, although he points out many of the fathers were like Augustine coming up on the 28th, um, were fond of, of Plato, but he did, he does mention Plato at such length in the essay on Emerson, which I will put in the description of this recording as well on BitChute and YouTube. Because um, remember, audience, uh, this takes two to tango, right? Tim and I put in our time to prep for this, but if you want to understand what we're saying, you have to read these texts too, just by the by. Um, we don't want to be consumers. <laughs> we want to be active, active uh, learners here. But um, it, that does, the, the conclusions of Plato about the soul, which Brownson gets into so much at length in, in his essay, they are, uh, they're necessary to understand how Emerson could come to his conclusions with the transcendentalists and Margaret Fuller and so forth about their, their concept of the oversoul. So uh, there's a lot of nuances there. If, if, if it's difficult, um, just be advised if you're going to get into the topic that Brownson's alluding to um, about transcendentalism, you need to know a little bit about Platonism and a little bit about the German um, uh, schools at that time. But Golly, Tim, wasn't that a testimony? That, that essay that we read, and that will be in the description here, that thing was published in a newspaper for any Tom, Dick, or Harry to read. Yeah, it, it, does, it does witness to the, the intellectual fervor. Despite what we're talking about, there was, um, I, I believe it, I can't believe, or I can't remember if it's de Tocqueville who mentions it, who observes that these common American farmers are reading Greek and Latin. I, is it the Tocqueville? Do you uh, the, um, the Tocqueville makes a similar um, comment. Actually, um, Henry David Thoreau, or maybe they both make comments on their own. I know Thoreau, as he was walking around the woods of, of Concord, a, at one point writes, I think in Walden, maybe a, a walk in, in the woods. Um, one of those, he, he did a lot of walking and, and, and thinking. But he says he came across a, a peasant farmer in Massachusetts you know, plowing and it was lunch break and he pulls out uh, the Iliad in, in Attic Greek and starts reading it. Yeah, that, and that's remarkable. I studied, I studied Homer in Greek in, uh, in college and that, I mean, that's pretty much the most difficult text in Greek. It has innumerable Greek words that appear nowhere else in the whole entire Greek le lexicon. I mean, it, it is the work. So this type of thing is is sort of strange and what you're what you're saying uh to us there was enough intellectual fervor where you could publish this thing in a newspaper i mean th this is a, a very uh, substantial philosophical essay i mean how many words is this like ten thousand words i mean it, it's quite large he has many greek and latin words that he's making reference to it does really um play into kind of what we're I, I guess what i what i claimed at some of the beginning remarks of this show that the revolutionary principle is with is about breaking with the past and i think that abandoning the the common philosophical discourse is part of that uh effort and and here we are today where we we it's very difficult to make a rational argument in a newspaper when when <laughs> thing is rationality just doesn't sell anymore so maybe it's sold at that time because people were interested but that that is a very that's a interesting lamentable remark and observation of the 19th century that we definitely have lost today as we turn towards our 20th century writers this is an apropos time, Tim, to talk about the value of reading literature. You see the, the hyper-literacy we see in the mid-19th century is, in one hand, it's, it's the, if we can speak of such a thing, the best of the Reformation, right? If, you, if your religion is based on a book, you end up producing, uh, by the 18th or 19th century, this obsession about letters that we see in Northern Europe. And yet, as we turn about specifically now uh, towards, towards fictional literature, um, one of the great um, poverties of, of uh, Protestantism, particularly American Protestantism, is any other sort of artwork whatsoever and any other sort of spirituality beyond the sermon. And I think a lot of that poverty uh, explains Brownson's own, own conversion and his own dissatisfaction with, with mili religious milieu 
he grew up in. So with all that, what is the value of reading literature? Why can't I uh, just read a catechism and just watch news and, and, and get all, um, um, you know, keep up to date with the latest happenings on Zenit and, and Angel Queen and so forth? What's the value of reading um, Catholic fictional literature? That's a, that, that's a really good thing to discuss uh, because I think that, that there was actually... Um, Stephanie, Stephanie Nichols, formerly Nichols, she's married now, I forgot her, her married name, but she did write an essay at One Prayer Five, which is where I write as well, about this very topic and the importance of reading literature and good literature. Um, and I wanted to find this quote from Brownson, because what, what he, his main critique of Emerson is basically that he's not, he, he doesn't pursue the fullness of the truth. He, he kind of, he kind of, uh, he receives the Protestant bias against Catholicism, just sort of writes it off and doesn't even think about it at all. And so, and then he talks about, Bronson talks about really Catholicity as a concept of universal truth in that the Catholic Church embraces all truth if it is really true. Um, and I think that one of the great, one of the great values of, of literature is to penetrate the truth and particularly the human person um, the truth of the human person and the difficulties of virtue and vice. One of the things that is gained by reading literature is that you are able to have an experience of virtue and vice that you, I mean, you really cannot grow in virtue and reject vice except through experience and long practice. Mm -hmm. But by, by reading literature, you're able to have a kind of experience like that where you are entering into a fictional account which is not real but is nevertheless very true and very applicable whether it's virtue or vice and i think the trait of really great literature in my opinion i think john i'd like to hear your your opinion as as more of a literary person uh to me i think that one of the the marks of the decline of literature in my view whether that's written or media of any kind is really that it it uh creates a fantasy world that has no uh no uh, really relationship to reality in, in the sense that we there is vice but vice is sort of rewarded and, and there's not like we can contra contrast this with a greek tragedy where uh someone someone commits these grave sins and they face the consequences and that's that's part of the whole story and we understand the reality of, of something and we face the truth and, and that's kind of the truth of of literature that's so powerful but modern literature is basically it's sort of a an attempt to avoid all forms of suffering whatsoever at all costs an attempt to maximize pleasure at all costs and create a world in which which has no correspondence to reality and which actually hurts you because if you try to follow that world and think that that's the real world because mm -hmm. people grow up watching tv and they think that's real life and it's not it's I, so i think that that's really the the power of really good literature and this is kind of what, what we're gonna, when these two no novels we're going to talk about i think or the short story from o'connor i think these sh these these novels what's great about and again, contrasting with Protestants, I think, because Protestant literature just does not really show the reality of human suffering, human virtue and vice. And I think great literature really shows the truth. It just, it just t tells you the truth, whether it's a good truth or a bad truth uh, or an unpleasant truth, rather, uh, it tells you the truth. And I think that's the great value. It has the Catholicity and you can grow in virtue in a way. So that's that's what I view as as sort of one of the marks of good literature. Yes, I think uh, it's also interesting in the context of your uh, comments just now, Tim. The uh, the fact, and you mentioned this, so suffering and then uh, sensual pleasure in in um, modern media or even contemporary media, um, closer to home, making that distinction between the two words that there's no suffering or suffering is if it exists at all is avoided or it, it just defaults into almost a pagan notion that you know only people who suffer were bad people and, and keep it moving um 
there's that unreality, and yet very often the the spicy sensual stuff, which finds its, itself overused uh, greatly in in all sorts of media, not the least of which being the visual, very often that is justified by well, it's real life. It's real. So there's there's an ignorance of. Um, um, of, of one huge aspect of life and, and uh, in, this, in this fallen world probably a lot more prominent than, than the sensual and that is the suffering. Um, that's ignored even though that's more real life in the way I'm trying to set it up than the, the, the spicy sensual that is um, tiresomely uh, used in, in tropes um, in the 20th century. Um, part of it too, and this would be a whole other discussion, is, is in the face of industrial secularism, and in particular in the violence of the 20th and, and um, continuing the violence of the wars and so forth, you also have the elevation, which is understandable on one level, I'm not, I'm not blessing it, but it is certainly understandable in just the insignificance that modern man feels because of his economic situation, because of his feeling in, po in, in political matters, in, in life circumstances, you do have the rise of the anti-hero, which is really a symptom, I would say, of the, the impersonalism, the anomie of, of modern, modern society too. But um, it, that, that itself is, we talk about revolutionary breaks, the anti-hero, the, the hero who has no redeeming um, virtue that grows in the story, no character arc towards, towards virtue, just wallows in, in vice and, and pity. We think of um, Catcher in the Rye would be the, the snapshot of this. Um, um, Hubert Shell Shelby, um, the Requiem for a Dream. Mm. We would think of, of um, Nabokov's Lolita and so forth. Just um, there's no virtue in this, and, and yes, it's a symptom of, of modernity in its own way, um, and that's where the criticism lies with modernity, not with the, the authors per se. They're just the symptom. But would, um, would you see that starting to really come to the fore with the lost generation with Hemingway and Fitzgerald? Yes. Oh, golly, yes. Um, and, and then very much. I mean, they, they more so than the, than the World War II generation, they're coming out of World War I, of course, um, they could see that that split, couldn't they? The um, there's actually a fantastic book by Paul Fussell called "The Great War in Modern Memory," Tim, which um, just talks about the the, the English speaking poets of the First World War, and you I mean you really get a snapshot of how just weird the literacy of the late 19th, early 20th century was. Uh, he speaks about more correspondence traveling through the English Channel than armaments during World War II. Um, so those people who had all of the introspection of, of the 19th century and all of the, the, the literature and the learning, they could see the break of, of modernity, uh, of what the World Wars, and particularly World War I, represented so much. Certainly Hemingway in, in the American experience um, and, and it's very interesting, poetry after World War I, right, goes from being British, and in fact all literature, I would argue, um, goes from being British to being American. It shifts. It shifts. And you have the, the rise of um, um, modernist poetry. And, and by the way, I know we have, a, uh, I'm sure, a lot of Catholics here uh, watching. I'm not using modernist here in the sense of, of the theology of the same time. They may have similarities, but modernist poetry is, is a different a creature, for instance, actually one of the greatest uh, modernist poets um, uh, was oh God, Wallace Stevens, a man uh, who settled in in uh, Connecticut and, and uh, had arguably was a Catholic convert. Though there's some controversy uh, between the priest who said he baptized him on his deathbed and and his daughter, but we won't get into um, boring uh, interpersonal rivalries. But the point is, yes, yes, you do see that break with, with authors, and you see that in modernist uh, poetry. You have, um, oh, I'm blanking on her. Um, uh, I, I, it just, what you said just made me think of The Great Gatsby and uh, how they, I mean, it's just kind of a story of uh, 
purposeless debauchery and, and nothingness. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how I would describe that story. And then they remade it as a movie recently in the past <laughs> five years or something. And it, and it kind of fit right in. It was just like, well, here's, here's this depressing tale of nothingness and we'll remake it with a bunch of hip hop music and it'll be a hit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exa I think that really shows the, the correspondence with sort of the same revolutionary principle, rejection of purpose, rejection of truth, meaninglessness, and the same kind of theme coming through. Absolutely. I mean, that's where it's, it's, it's where you get, I, it was Virginia Woolf. I was thinking about the, her statement, uh, make it new, make it new. And so, you know, all this, this revolutionary thinking to follow a theme in our, our recording so far, it leads to the trenches. It leads to Flanders field. It certainly leads to the Eastern front and, and things out there. And so, you almost get this idea of the blind leading the blind. Well, if, if making everything new led to this, well, let's just make it new. Um, there, I, I do believe, by the by, before we move on to, to Green here, um, didn't they, they did a film about 10 years ago, uh, not just The Great Gatsby, they did one on the French Revolution with Marie Antoinette, and they did the same thing with pop music. Uh, trying oh, that's to true, them. yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's, oh, that was a terrible movie. Back when I was watching movies, I've, I've since abandoned film. <laughs> but the authors that we're about to talk to, um, Grand Green and certainly Flannery O'Connor, uh, they're writing at a time, um, as Marshall McLuhan, a contemporary of theirs, would note that visual media of the sort that causes Tim and I such, uh, such angst here um, with, with its use of musical choices, in historical themes. Uh, these authors, Green and, and O'Connor, they're really having to contend with, with an, a public which is reading less and less, even in the mid-20th century. And I'm, I'm, um, I make the point that both our selections, and we'll begin with, with The Power and the Glory, are significantly shorter than 19th century novels, and that's not a mistake. Um, people's attention spans are, are listing, and we can see that in, in both of these, uh, these pieces here and in, in books in general, they get much shorter in the 20th century. Um, so Graham Greene finds himself, and I'll ask him to maybe give the, the specific uh, background of the Cristada and, and so forth in Mexico, but um, Graham Greene finds himself in the late 1930s uh, in Mexico, and he writes a nonfiction book about um, the situation there. Some people say he was there to flee a lawsuit from 20th Century Fox for his, um, his unfavorable review of a Shirley Temple film, and he had to find a country that didn't have extradition, so he, he went to Mexico. Um, but while there, regardless of his motive, he, um, he writes this book and um, a nonfiction book about the situation, the political situation of revolutionary Mexico. And Tim, um, maybe to give a background, can you talk a little bit um, just br briefly about the Cristada and about the, the, the persecution there in Mexico? Yeah, um, well, Mexico is in fact the first communist country, um, which is a funny fact we don't realize, but uh, it adopted uh, by the, the president Calles, C-A-L-L-E-S, was adopting a communist platform and turned around and began to try to exterminate the church, as the communists always do. And this provoked, as it did in France with the Vendée 100 years earlier, and uh, even with the Pilgrimage of Grace in, in Britain, be years, be hundreds of years of years before that, there, was, there has been a few different counter-revolutionary movements that were military in nature by the Catholics, Catholic laymen, taking up arms against a government who was taking up arms against them, uh, especially when there was an established tradition of cent centuries of, of Catholicism. And so the Christiata, uh, there's a, there, I think the film that came out for Greater Glory is quite good. I haven't studied the movement in, it, in uh, detail, so I, I can't vouch for its historicity, uh, nor can I speak too much in detail, but this is, so this is a movement that goes against Calles, who is going about, um, murdering priests, the, the famous Miguel Pro, blessed Miguel Pro, there's the, the, the uh, photo of him with his arms out like this, saying, Viva Cristo Rey, he forgave his executioners and blessed them, and uh, many great martyrs 
during this time. But the, the, the movement was also, examples of uh, propaganda blowing up in in the iron <laughs> face. Yes, yeah, that, and so that was a uh, and that the movement itself was controversial as well because the the high the bishops and hierarchy were divided on it. I believe they're mostly mostly anti Christiana, and Pope Pius the eleventh. Um, it is said that he was sort of conjoled into an agreement uh, against them, which ended in the deaths of many Catholics. So it was a very difficult time. And uh, the story that Graham Greene gives us is, is, I think it's a great example of what we're talking about, the example of truth, where we have this whiskey priest who's a very corrupted man, who's a priest who uh, is struggling in this, in this time period of persecution with his own duties and his own sins. And I think it's a great juxtaposition between sort of the worst of the Catholic Church, corrupted priest, and the best of the Marxists who are fighting against him. And I think that's a very powerful juxtaposition that our Catholic author gives because he, he sort of, I think, tells a lesson about this, this whole struggle between the Catholic Church and Marxism, which is still going on today, especially in our American <laughs> context. Yes, and you know, uh, Tim recently had a gentleman on on um, Black American history, and uh, just as a corollary to to the topic of of uh, religious race relations, uh, the uh, ambassadors for the the um, Cristeros, which would be the the fighters in the Cristada, which is the the um, military action that Tim mentions. They came to these United States to the bishops and they expected uh, somewhat uh, sensibly that they would receive the same reception, for instance, Sinn Féin and the IRA did, who were having their own uh, war of liberation at that time, not nearly as religious, although that would be an interesting topic um, for another recording because there are uh, undertones there. Nevertheless, uh, the the uh, ambassadors for this these uh, Catholic rebels uh, <laughs> were basically given like twenty bucks and a sandwich and told to go take a hike. It was a absolute backstabbing on on the betrayal of the American episcopacy and the American Church onto the Mexican Church. Very very unfortunate the way they were treated there. Um, and before we dive into the themes in the book, I came across a, a quote here um, because, you know, Flannery O'Connor also touches on this. Uh, definitely Green does. They also step on the toes of the pious, not on orthodoxy and on the faith itself, but on certain of the comeuppance of the, of the pious. And the power and the glory received um, a censure from, from the... Um, the index from that office, and uh, I know there's there are people who who long for the days of the index to be back, but it would it would continually bring up um, all these examples in literature where there were these misunderstandings. So I'd like to read this quote from Evelyn Waugh, uh, himself a convert uh, from the world, uh, talking about this controversy over the power and the glory, but. Uh, there were many changes in the church that are regrettable in the last half century. For my own opinion, I don't think the index going away was, was a bad one, though. Wall says regarding Green, The Archbishop of Westminster read to me a letter from the Holy Office condemning my novel, so he's speaking about Graham Greene, um, because it was paradoxical and dealt with extraordinary circumstances in Mexico. The price of liberty, even within the church, is eternal vigilance. But I wonder whether any of the totalitarian states would have treated me as gently when I refused to revise the book on no caustical ground that the copyright was in the hands of my publishers. <laughs> so for the, the attorneys come to the rescue. Um, there was no public condemnation and the affair was allowed to drop into that peaceful oblivion with the church, which wisely reserves itself uh, for such unimportant issues. Tim, what is in the power and the glory that might um, uh, humble down the pride of, of uh, certain sorts? What might, might um, not offend the piety or the doctrine, but what, what is it about the power and the glory that might uh, cause a controversy? Uh, well, 
the the priest is a corrupted priest and he's uh an alcoholic he has committed immorality and he so he he presents the priesthood in a very bad light he's <laughs> pretty much the worst of priests and uh this does not doesn't bring the church in a shining example of triumph in, in a very dark time against the church and so that's very controversial because we all want the saints to be the saints are our heroes and we we read their lives and we want them to be our heroes and and we have sort of a a, a very difficult figure as our protagonist in this story who is very contradictory very weak uh he's not inspiring and yet he's he is penetrating penetrated with a sense of duty which he battles and uh with his demons that he battles which is it's a very compelling story uh to go through and to juxtapose with the marxist critique of the church I would also say in my reading of this text, and I was I was delighted to read it because it's been sitting on my shelf forever. I got in a used book sale this this edition, and and this interview was a great opportunity to to do my homework. I found, uh, in addition to to uh, the the theme that uh, Tim brings up there, the the weakness of the priest there, which may have stepped on the the faithful. I also noticed in Green's writing, there's a well, there's a, a head-on attack against uh, self-righteousness of a sort that only people who are pious can, uh, in the truest sense of self-righteousness, in the worst sense of pharisaicalism, that's there when the priest is in the jail and he meets the, the, uh, the pious woman there and she's looking down on all these other sinners and, you know, look at me, I'm, I'm here suffering purely for the faith, allegedly. Um, but look at these sinners, and I found that to be, if I, I don't know the background specifically, but I know a certain sort, and if, if, um, if I had to put money on it, I would say it would be those, those critiques in the book of the, the pomposity, which certain uh, personality types can fall into, and the assurance and the self-righteousness that Green just takes and, and just decks with his, his uh, pen and his typewriter so deftly. Yeah, I think uh, the, the critique of, and, and I think this is really the, the main provocation of Marxism, and this is what is constantly the critique of the Marxist antagonist. I'm, I'm going to read from, uh, Please. what is this? Chapter three of part three, where the lieutenant, the antagonist of the priest says, um, we have ideas too. No more money for saying prayers. No more money for building places to say prayers in. We'll give the people food instead. Teach them to read, give them books. We'll see they don't suffer. And I think that this is sort of the critique the provocation and this is what uh, Pius the 11th actually says in Divini Redditoris in 1937 around the same time he says there wouldn't really be communism if Catholics just did their job and they they loved people and fed the poor there wouldn't be this provocation to Marxism where the Marxists can come and critique this self-righteousness um, where there is a pomposity and there's neglect of the the poor and the suffering where the Marxist has has a certain amount of righteous indignation which to a degree is legitimate, which he is able to then manipulate the masses into a Marxist revolution. So I think this, this story is so powerful because it, it confronts that in its, in its deepest, um, what I love about the story is that it, it really confronts Marxism in the most powerful way because it confronts Marxism with the worst of Catholicism. Like, it, it, you know, the priest is the worst of the priests. And, and, and in, there is a, there's a way that, I think Graham Greene still makes the church come out on top, even though it's a very tragic tale. And I think that's what makes the novel so excellent. Yes. And I think, you know, um, both, both to your comments just now and then to, to the, the theme I was riffing on as well, there's also a, a thread that the novel brings up throughout and indeed closes up on this. And that is... Uh, gentlemen, fathers of families out there, please pay attention in particular, um, the futility of 
a, a certain feminine religion by itself or a certain feminine piety. And we have this heroic mother trying to instill the faith, trying to keep the fire going. And we have this teenage kid throughout who is just not buying it. And he's, you know, we're kind of reading at bedtime at, at different vignettes as the mother's reading a rather syrupy story about some, some unnamed Mexican martyr. Um, and the kid's just yawning and he's waiting for the guy to die. So it's at least a little bit interesting and, and this sort of thing. And the actually it's one of the closing scenes of the text where the the child who we don't know we don't know the priest's name either incidentally um the the kid who had been looking up to the lieutenant right this marxist lieutenant the kid he he sees the priest ex who's executed it's it's somewhat even muted in the text even though the whole book builds up to his execution it's almost like peripheral when it finally does happen um, I'm not going to go digging around here. I'll, I'll, I believe it's on page 220, uh, so I will dig around, but yes, here we go. Here we go. So this is where the kid, he's seen the martyrdom of the priest in the square. This kid who's been bored by this feminine uh, type of, of pietism, and he had been looking up to this Marxist lieutenant character and his boots and his pistol and his strength and, and this sort of thing. I think this is a spoiler alert. Just okay for the viewers thank you yes yes so um all the viewers have read all these books before uh, oh, okay these parts uh but thank you so much for that i'll have to do a, a flashing uh thing there but yes a spoiler alert but this is where the kid changes because he sees virtue in action he sees an action being the masculine principle he sees it and he acts on it and grace moves him the child squatted at the top of 220 in this penguin edition beside the window Starting out, and behind his back came a muffled sound of small girls going to bed. It brought it to home at once to have had a hero in the house. The whiskey priest had visited the house and had kind of been shown the back door pretty quick, you know. Um, though it lasted only for 24 hours, there was a hero here, and he was the last. There were no more priests and no more heroes. He listened resentfully. Now it's resentfully to the sound of booted feet coming up the pavement, the man he had looked up to. Ordinary life pressed around him. He got down from the window seat and picked up his candle. Very powerful here. Zapata, Villa, Nador, and the rest, they were all dead. And it was people like the man out there who killed them. And he felt deceived. And I found that such an insight. Um, not just to the consideration, Tim, of grace, but also to the type of apparatchik which inevitably takes over after these revolutions, kills whatever was good, whatever was, you know, maybe disordered, but whatever was heroic in the initial revolutionaries. And I thought that was so powerful to lump in the priest's heroism, which is at the end, push comes to shove, he, he, he dies for the faith, with whatever was best in, in the lesser uh, heroes that were mentioned there. Yeah, that's that's really great. In, in the moment of clarity of seeing through the the revolutionary Marxist revolutionary heroes that are propped up, as we saw back with Noah Webster, uh, trying to create a new culture, and then we have an encounter with a heroism that connects with the mist of time, and that's what really provides this clarity that really has a changing effect. And I think that that's that sort of connection with our fathers brings, I know that for me, when I converted Catholicism, a big part of that was sort of reconciling myself with my own past of my father, my own fathers, my own heritage, my own European culture. And coming to that moment of clarity is sort of coming to a natural sense of one's own uh, heritage. So as we're moving along here, we come to our last and indeed our shortest piece. And that is a Good Country People by Flannery O'Connor. And Tim and I, uh, we have the same text. Let's hold it up here. <laughs> yeah. There we go, right? Great minds think alike. And, and great Amazon algorithms think alike too, I suppose, when, yes. when you pick this yes, stuff up. It's actually pretty good. I like this, uh, you know, it's, it's floppy, but it's, it holds together. It's good binding. 
anyhow, um, we, we have with Flannery O'Connor something we saw maybe a generation before with G.K. Chesterton, and that is a, a keener sense of humor in the face of darkness. So, Tim, what's this story about? And, and let's um, dive into some of the themes. Yeah, it, it's basically about a, what I, I gather as a, a, a normal, a somewhat normal Southern family. Um, there are, there's basically Northern, or there's normal Southern two women, uh, Mrs. Freeman and Mrs. Hopewell, who are just sort of your, your normal Southern Belle type uh, that I think the, the story brings out. And then there's sort of this black sheep of the family um, <clears throat> who is, is this rebel. She's sort of the figure of, of this revolutionary spirit that we've kind of discussed. And she's, <laughs> she's rebelling against this, uh, this I think what, what you mentioned with Green, the pomposity and the self-righteousness that allows the revolutionary to, to take on a, a certain amount of righteous uh, anger. And so Holga, uh, I forgot what her, it was Joy. Joy is her, her, her given name, and then she changes her own name to Holga um, as a way of rebellion, basically. And she's, she's highly educated. And so I think, I mean, I think I see the main theme really as coming to terms with your, your parents and, and their generation. Um, but I believe, if I recall, her, her mother was actually divorced. Um, yes, that is correct. Actually, right, so, that, is, that is right. So there's, there's actually a fracturing in the family already where there is a break, breaking with the past, really. And then this, this second generation is, is then breaking with the past. And so there's a struggle with that. But then there's this, this kind, concept of good country people that they keep on repeating in this story. And I, 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 view, I read that as a reference to a common uh, morality, a common uh, heritage that's passed down through generation that, that forms that bond of father to son and mother to daughter, which is being strained by this, this relationship. Um, so I think it's a very, I mean, I think O'Connor does such a great job in a short story of 20 pages of packing a massive punch, which really is, it's, uh, it's just massive. And that's what makes her so great, I think. Um, and then they meet this young man who comes to, the, to their house. So uh, I'll, I'll pass the mic, though. For sure, for sure. And actually, that young man, I think uh, he brings up a theme that, that Graham Greene also riffs on. The young man is a Bible salesman, right? And one of the things that we see there, I think it's, it's worth bringing out, if I can find my... Uh, here we go. Uh, my, my Power and the Glory as well. And these books were the story, um, Good Country People, and 15 years before, uh, The Power and the Glory, right? They're, they're within, um, you know, spitting distance of each other in terms of publication history. They both talk about the commercialism of American religion. So you have um, the, the Bible salesman, uh, Pointer, I think is his, his last name there. And then in the power and the glory, you have this, this delicious scene um, that I, I'd like to go back to just for a, a hot second here on page 165. But it's the same theme that I think these, these American authors are able to, to riff on. And that is that commercialism. So um, the, the whiskey priest in our, our previous story, he goes into this house of the Americans and he finds um, a Gidgen's Bible, right? The, the Bibles, I think the Marxists have kicked them out of the, the hotels, but these, these Bibles that you used to find when I was a kid in every hotel, right? Good old King James. And he reads the, the index here. And these are the themes that the readers, the presumably American readers, might have. These are the spiritual tribulations they may come across, right? If you are in trouble, read Psalm 34. If trade is poor, Psalm 37. If it's very prosperous, you might want to read 1 Corinthians 10. If you overcome or backsliding in your faith, you have 1 James or Hosea. If you're tired of sin, you have Psalm 51. If you have a desire for peace, power and plenty, go to John 14. If you are lonesome or discouraged, Psalm 23 or 27. If you're, if you're losing your confidence in men, a Corinthians, and if you desire a good night's sleep, Psalm 121. 
all in the Masoretic, by the way. Um, but nevertheless, the 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 mixing there of very you know very deep sentiments such as loneliness with um, you know with trade and commerce. I found that such a tickle, and I see that in the, the character of the Bible salesman too in Good Country People. Yeah, I, I, it's really. Um, I guess since we're giving away all the the endings here, spoiler alert again, go read the text. It's not, it's not that long. Um, yeah, it really, I, I really thought this story was incredible. I'd never read it before. Um, because I think that what's so interesting in the, is the, the figure of Holga as she attempts to corrupt the Bible salesman who puts on this, this show of being very pious and then what's so incredible is that it ends up being the other way around. And, and I think that that's, um, and the, the theme of good country of people, I think it's, it's such a powerful picture of the, the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of tradition and culture in this, this whole story, because it really shows uh, the, the concept of good country people is targeted by uh those who wish to break down the family the family it really is the the epicenter of culture and tradition and also specific, particularly for this story the it is the shelter for the children and the, and the protection from the world and from evil in the world and i think that this it, it's i i think that the the great truth of this story that comes out is that the Holga's rejection of the family, in a sense, leads to her, her own uh, her own th threatenings on her as well, uh, because it, and it actually comes about through that that very rebellion. And I think that's a that's a great truth. I think um, that I see in the story. Something that impressed me is in the second reading, and that's something I'm a, a great criminal in doing is not doing second and third and fourth readings of things. And so I'm the head of, of that criticism there uh, and, and the most guilty. But I, I think it's an art form that's lost is rereading things. But I did have the chance to reread this um, for, for uh, this presentation this morning. And one line jumped out. And that's the benefit of rereading is you'll see things you don't. That's why, you know, the Bible, you, you go in cycles and things, right, in, in the liturgy. Um, things jump out. And one little line jumped out at me. And that is, um, as she's trying to seduce him, and, and she knows what's right, and this, this, that, and this guy is just some hillbilly from the country, and he turns out to be a, a, a shyster. Um, one little line is said that she didn't pay much attention to her surroundings. And, because he, I think he points to the barn or something like that, and, and she, I can do that, and, and this, that, and the other. But it, it brought my attention to early in the novel that mentioned how this character, Holga, or Joy, um, got her, her physical um, notability. She's an amputee, right? She lost a leg. That's a, a trope throughout the story, as you'll find out, viewers. And how, do you remember, Tim, I don't want to put you on the spot. We'll have a high school pop quiz. Do you remember how she lost her leg in the story? Uh, I was it that she wasn't watching or something? I don't recall. Yeah, it's a little detail. It's a little detail. She lost it in a hunting accident at 10 years of age. Yeah, it was and, shot off in a hunting accident when Joy was 10. Right. And um, whether it's that terrible misfortune or the terrible misfortune which concludes the story, we have... In that, you can see this character trait that Flannery was able to, to identify, um, which is a human trait, isn't it? The, the um, heedlessness, heedlessness. And so we see that um, in her, her pride, in the truest sense of the word, uh, in the negative understanding of that, um, that vice of pride, um, this is something that doesn't just lead to the ultimate misfortune of the little story, but we can connect it to also what what would a 10 year old little girl be doing on a hunting trip except maybe pestering the hunters or being in some place that she shouldn't have been um, and never paying attention to her surroundings? Yeah, that's, that's a really great uh, observation, John. Uh, and I think that goes into just the, what we're talking about with this sort of revolutionary theme we have going on. 
um, with it is really the rejection of reality it is really this this movement is is an attempt to suppress reality and that's kind of what we're talking about with literature and that's like that's um i i i think i thought of before when we were talking a little bit about film if you compare the jesus movie jesus of nazareth which was made by protestants you compare that to the passion of the christ that's sort of what we're getting at because the thing protestant spirituality is sort of about creating an emotional experience and i was a protestant for most of my life and i deep, deeply respect many protestants um for their faith and their devotion but the the spirituality is very impoverished because it's very much about creating a emotional experience which is sort of an emotional high or even an intellectual high through a sermon and i think that that is an attempt to escape reality and not face suffering and i think the the marxist or revolutionary is also trying to create another world and like, like we talked about with the decline of literature in media it is a, a an attempt to shirk reality and and get outside of reality and escape reality in their attempt to uh escape the suffering because they don't have the cross they can't face the suffering because they don't have the cross which is uh which is a, a pity really. Um, but I think what you're bringing out is, is such a powerful observation of not being aware of your surroundings and really not um, having the sort of common sense, we might say, to, to face reality, uh, but also I think the wounding that, that causes either through sin, uh, either it's our own sin or the sin of our parents, like we talked, this is a divorced family um, or different things like that. The sins that are done to us or sins that we commit, which darken our intellect and cause us to be wounded in some way and make it even more difficult for us to embrace reality as such. I think that's a very powerful observation uh, because she really does not pay attention to her surroundings and it, uh, it is to her misfortune. You know, you make the, the film comparison there, and I want to make a literary one, but much like Tim, I, I do want to say that if anyone's watching um, from the Protestant world or, or background there, um, the critiques we've made are of these of the traditions of the ideas. We're not speaking to the to the um, the virtues of the of the people themselves, which which do exist. So I hope these critiques that have come up are taken in the right spirit and um, with that being said, I, I was thinking in the, in the context of um, the first part of our discussion, <laughs> the comparison between uh, Dante's Commedia, this, um, this uh, poetic masterpiece, and there is actually a Protestant um, uh, analog to that, and that's, of course, Pilgrim's Progress. And, but their leagues, their leagues, um, different. Pilgrim's Progress is, is almost a children's book in terms of its simplicity. And there is that lack of that artistic, um, concept of, even though the premises are, are pretty much the same of a soul taking a journey, um, whether it's Pilgrim or Dante, respectively, um, there is a, a, a degradation of, of the profundity of the work, and, and that, that ought to be worth consideration in terms of uh, perhaps a commentary on the ideas that undergird the, the backgrounds of those authors or those film uh, producers. Yeah, I think of uh, definitely the, the profundity um, which is penetrating the reality uh, of the situation. I, so I think Good Country People, uh, it just really, it, it shows a reality, which is not pleasant. Th this is a, here's a quote from uh, actually a musician, Lauren Hill. She says, fantasy is what people want, but reality is what they need. I think that's that's one of the greatest things about good literature, that it gives us what we need in the fact that it gives us some reality, even though it's really a fictional reality, but it is a reflection that of real life. As we bring things to a close here, Tim, what would be some contemporary distinguished from modern? So we would say modern, go back to, you know, 20th century, mid 20th century, but contemporary nowadays, what would be some authors or some texts that you might uh, recommend? And I have a couple here myself. Well, this one is, 
this this is not this is still modern. This is Silence by Shusako Endo, and this is essentially almost the same story as Graham Greene, except in Japan. And uh, this is probably my favorite book ever, my favorite novel ever. Um, it's uh, probably I think it's the only book that I ever actually shed tears while right while reading. It's it's very very powerful. Um, the 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 movie is is was made by Scorsese and I think he did a good job but you can never really replicate a a book in a movie it's just impossible is that with Liam Neeson um, that one yes yep um, so I you know I I have actually been reading a few um, off I've been there's a few new Catholic authors that have sent me their books that I'm reading um, and I don't want to reveal them yet. I don't, so <laughs> I don't really know what to say. Honestly, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I hope you'll help me, John, because I, I actually don't know a lot of contemporary authors producing really excellent fiction, uh, excellent literature. And maybe you can help me out with that because I, I, contemporary wise, I, I, I'm really at a loss actually. Yes, well, there's two I thought of uh, to mention here, and, and all the viewers will go over to Tim's channel. They're going to subscribe, they're going to like, they're going to hit up his Patreon and, and all this stuff that you're going to tell us about in a second here. Um, and, and you're going to go over there in a couple months and you're going to get some good books. You're going to follow up on this and, and we'll find out about some of those, those texts there. But two uh, that I, I'll bring to our attention here as we wind down is uh, one from Arthur Powers, whom I'm going to be interviewing next week. And that's the book of Jotham, the book of Jotham. And this uh, concerns a, um, a retarded or, or we'll say mentally handicapped uh, disciple of Christ. So it's, it's kind of through his, his uh, eyes, we'll say, and, and his perceptions. And certainly the, um, the value of, of the handicap, so-called, uh, is something that, like many, many aspects of life, is, is something that industrial modernity has no place for whatsoever. And that the, uh, the Catholic Church and uh, such authors are commendable for bringing to our attention the value of, of those people. So the book of Jotham is one, and, and if you want to hear that interview, come back uh, in a couple of weeks, next week. Um, and then another one which received uh, quite a bit more um, pop press, at least around here, I'm in Connecticut here, uh, in the New York Times and, and down on Broadway, or off-Broadway, it was produced, but the play, and plays can be literature, um, of the Heroes of the Fourth Turning, Heroes of the Fourth Turning, which speaks to a lot of dynamics in, in American politics, American um, I don't know what the generations are called. They keep changing them. These are Marxism. They keep changing the, the name of Generation X dynamics. And also uh, people of faith in, in that context. And the Times did a big write-up there. I, I may have that, that gentleman on if he gets a, a spare second. But the heroes of the fourth turning certainly speaks to a lot of things going on. And in particular, I would say the conservative world and, and conservative youth and so forth. So um, I would recommend that. Also, I'll put this in the description uh, of this recording. Joseph Pierce has uh, produced uh, an article just on this very topic where he lists about 20 or 30 authors um, who are worth looking at for contemporary Catholic uh, writing and fiction. So there's stuff out there, uh, but it usually doesn't get the New York Times treatment, which is why we don't hear about it that often. That's excellent. Thanks for sharing, John. Yes, yes. Now, Tim, as we as we close it down, you know, um, there's a a, a um, uh, custom of of singing the Psalms, and and if you uh, say sex, we're about an hour past uh, <laughs> the regular time and and the Angelus. So we're going to wind it down for for uh, prayers and lunch and, and get on with our day here. But before we do that, Tim, uh, tell us about your your website. Where can we go? Um, COVID-19 is going to break everyone. I think that's the plan, but that's another recording. Um, tell How can we support you in terms of, of uh, monetary? Where can we buy um, merch? Break it down. Sure. Yeah, well, I have um, a small publishing company with Meaning of Catholic, Our Lady of Victory Press. We have two books out right now. We have a third coming soon. That's the first public announcement of this. Um, that's going to be coming in the next uh, few months. And... Uh, if you go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic, you can support the work that we do. 
and uh, we're on YouTube, Twitter. Uh, you can start with meaningofcatholic.com. Up at the top of the website, there are resources, and these are all the essential texts that you need to be a Catholic and get through the crisis in the church and also COVID-1984. So um, take a look at meaningofcatholic.com, and if we can do, do anything for you, let us know. Excellent, excellent. And uh, once again, if you're interested in my educational work, uh, we teach at an undergraduate level here in New Milford, Connecticut. Uh, but there are public events when we're <laughs> when the archons allow us to um, to go into public again. Uh, there are things at libraries, history societies, schools, museums. Uh, presentations that we do as well as all this online stuff. So the, the central clearinghouse of all that is apocrystostasisinstitute.wordpress.com. You may write me, John Coleman, at apocrystostasisinstitute at aol.com. Timothy Flanders, thank you so much for your time. Please stay on here. Thanks, John.